Okay, um, welcome to the, uh, to the seminar series. Um, I'm delighted today to be able to introduce Brad Fidler, who's been visiting campus for three days now. I think. So we've, um, we've not had our fill of you yet, Brad. We're going to extract more value. Um, Brad um, is Assistant Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, he was previously a researcher with the UCLA Computer Science Department, um, with strong connections with the ICP, I guess, um, and uh, is currently um, a visiting research scholar at the USC Information Systems Sciences Institute Hostel Center, and a contractor with Google and ICANN, who's been signing a letter about Google and their policies. Um, he studies the political and social dimensions of internet technologies, how social forces impact the design and operation of online technologies, and how these technologies in turn impact society. Um, I think you can all see the title as well as I can, so welcome, Brad. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is one of my favorite departments, I, I, I tell people, so it's really great to be here. It's exciting to be here. And uh, thanks to Dr. Crooks for inviting me. Uh, and today, my talk, it, it's toward a political economy of cybersecurity because I'm not going to lay out a grand system of how that political economy operates, but rather try to look at some categories and some principles that would be, I think, useful in telling and retelling what a kind of general framework for that, uh, for that political economy, uh, what it might look like. This comes from uh, a bit of work that's been published already. Some of this is from a book that is coming out of mine with MIT Press uh, early next year, and then also some work I'm doing with a colleague, uh, Pundu Pond from UW, writing a book called The Encrypted Information Society. Uh, my introduction already covers my conflict of interest statement. Needless to say, this does not reflect the view of any of my uh, employers, as, as will be evident, I think. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I want to start with a FOIL. Uh, and whenever you're talking about networks, whenever you're talking about the internet or the network society or the information age, this is a really, this is a place where people often will start, right? And uh, how many people have seen this diagram in things they read at some regularity? So, the number of you. Okay, so for those of you that uh, have not, this comes out of the work of someone named Paul Barron, work he started in the late 1950s, uh, wrapped up by the mid-1960s. It was for the US Air Force, done at Rand Corporation. And he was looking at different structures of communication networks. And he'd said that while we had already some centralized communication networks and some even some decentralized ones, what we need to build for maximum resiliency, for example, in the face of nuclear attack, is the distributed network network type number C, and he also developed, he's one of the first people to think through this notion of packet switching where the information that would go, that would take independent paths through this network would be broken into discrete units and could be routed independently. Uh, nowadays, this, uh, this kind of three-stage story becomes a bit of a movement of history, right? In, in social theory, in histories of the internet and even histories of what can variously be called the information age or network society, switch any of those words around. When people talk about a society being more networked and information driven, this becomes a kind of a theory of history where uh, we went from a more centralized kind of architecture of power or of the economy uh, and certainly of communication and then this gradually became decentralized uh, and distributed. And the way that the story is told when it's told about the origins of uh, the internet specifically, is that there were these contradictions within an unfree socio-technical system that created spaces of freedom from which a new class of innovators emerged. So for example, within the hierarchies of the Department of Defense, there were these really innovative labs run by organizations like DARPA, where you had the people who developed the technologies for the internet. From that new class of innovators, uh, they would pioneer the kernel of a new set of technologies and socio-technical relations, which would then enable kind of a new production distribution uh, communication paradigm, uh, which would act as a solvent on the old social order. So the internet would emerge first as this embryonic force, 
and then overtake the world, uh, casting aside vestiges of the old social order. <clears throat> And this is, this, this, the way that the story is often told is really just, it's the way history of capitalism, right? Which I've illustrated with this, this kind of diagram where you have, over time, increasing levels of uh, freedom kind of unfolding. So the way that this history of capitalism is told is that you had feudalism within the contradictions of feudal authority in the cities. You had the bourgeoisie emerge. They pioneered this new, this new set of relationships, uh, capitalist social relationships, capitalist practices that dissolved the old order. And this, uh, this kind of take on the history of the, what might be called the network society uh, can be repeated either as an act of congratulation or as an act of critique. Just like, for example, the Communist Manifesto uh, echoes the same story told in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, this what's now understood as a kind of pro-capitalist book, right? Where regardless of whether or not you problematize these changes, there is an agreement that these, these changes occurred more or less in a certain order. And so, for example, today, the people that say this is, this is good, you have, for example, maybe the Wall Street Journal or the Electronic Frontier Foundation on the one hand, and then people who, while not necessarily saying it's bad, they would at least problematize it. Uh, people like Alexander Galloway, Parton Negri, uh, and other scholars. And what I'm going to offer today in this talk is that uh, thinking about the uh, evolution of a networked society where were these independent nodes no longer relying on, on central authorities uh, to govern our lives as much. I'd say that this form of that history misses some key kind of contradictions and tensions that gets glossed over in this kind of telling of the story. And I'll look at how uh, different kind of dominant works make use of this kind of kernel of the story in their understanding uh, of how we got to this present moment. And when I do this, I'm kind of following uh, Chris Kelty's Against Networks. It's, it's a piece of almost of a decade and a half, a decade and a half ago, where he says that if, if, if networks are kind of a method for understanding society, we should be serious about understanding the internet as a particularly popular and dominant and successful network. And then the other thing I'll add to that is that if the internet is being used as a technology isomorphism to understand society, we should try to be as clear as possible what the internet is and, and what the internet isn't, as technology isomorphisms have historically been bad social theory. So for example, our, our brains are not clocks and gears, uh, the economy's not a computer, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and just before we, before we move on, I, I wanted to note a couple of things uh, about this foil. Uh, this kind of progression from centralized, not only communications infrastructures, but you know, architectures of power, uh, I, I'm not entirely convinced, for example, that the world operates in this distributed capacity. Uh, you can claim that it does. I could just, in response, claim that it doesn't. There's, there's metrics such as, for example, the uh, amount of space that mergers and acquisitions take up in our economy that has continued to rise despite the emergence of this network society. Uh, as a literal description of the internet, uh, type, it's on both sides, type C, uh, the internet does not actually look like that for a lot of reasons. And the, you know, the original reason why Paul Barron thought about distributed adaptive networks was to create a resilient command and control system so that if the United States was attacked, there'd still be the communication infrastructure in place to be able to get the launch codes out and fire back, thereby creating disincentives to first strike attacks. Uh, what's interesting about this is that the United States command and control system also never became this distributed uh, infrastructure the United States has never had a secure uh, command and control system. And in fact, the way that they actually dealt with this problem of communication in a post-attack environment was to delegate nuclear launch authority to local commanders, which is what Russia did as well. Super dangerous, but it also gets you away from the necessity of your communication infrastructure surviving so that you can maintain communications in that post-attack scenario. So there's a, a number of reasons then why I don't think this really serves that well as a description of the internet, as a description of the architectures of society, as even a description of the thing that it was hoping to change, which is the United States and military command and control system. Now, nonetheless, there's been a number, I'm just kind of picking three, uh, interesting, important, thoughtful, thought-provoking books that nonetheless uh, use uh, Paul Barron's, not only the centrality of him as a thinker, but also this notion that there's this distributed architecture of, of social relations more generally in society 
they use that as a starting point. Uh, and it takes, so for example, with Alexander Galloway's protocol, as well as slightly uh, earlier stuff he did in the early 2000s with uh, Eugene Thacker, it starts from the assumption that we do actually live in a far more decentralized or even distributed world. And then his question is, well, how can control function given that distribution of power? Uh, I'll come back to uh, Castell's uh, later in the talk. Uh, Springer makes an interesting use of uh, Baron in a way that's uh, similar and draws directly on uh, pardon me, Alexander uh, Galloway. Uh, and for these kinds of works, this, this transition from a more centralized architecture of not only communications but society, uh, this transition is seen to be kind of underway or in, in stages of at least completing the first phase. And what I would like to do is go back through this uh, history and actually look at a couple things that I think we should reconsider when trying to figure out how we got uh, to where we are today. So there's two tensions or uh, perhaps contradictions that I'm going to uh, look at today. One is the distinction between the network and the host. So the network is, this is a term that we're like, use, I'm using it literally to refer to, for example, a communications network like, like the internet. And the host is the name that we give to the devices that are attached to it that can do the communicating on it. So a smartphone, a laptop, a, a mainframe computer, if it was a little while ago. And the other distinction that I want to talk about is that of between plain text and ciphertext. So between unencrypted information and encrypted information. And my argument is that both of these distinctions were actually constructed historically. There were certain places and times where these distinctions did not exist in the way that they do today. And looking to how and when these distinctions were created can actually tell us a different story than the one that's offered by these uh, kind of different takes of Paul Brand's move from a centralized to a distributed, uh, to a distributed society. I'll also argue that for these kind of dominant stories of us emerging into a distributed world, for those stories to make sense, these distinctions between network and host and be between plain text and ciphertext actually have to have existed and also more or less have to be naturalized. And I'll, I'll get to uh, how that's the case uh, in a minute. Now, uh, the distinction between network and host. This is self-evident today. People, non-computer scientists say, like, there is this thing that we call the internet, and then there's this thing that would be called my computer, and they're analytically and even technologically different things. I want to tell a very brief story from 1954 until 1968 of how this distinction emerged in the area of computer communications. So kind of going through history, one of the earliest cases of uh, connecting two computers together uh, comes from 1954, in fact. Uh, two computer systems, the SIAC and the DICIAC, at the National Bureau of Standards, that's now NIST. This is the DICIAC, it was built into a truck. Uh, so this is very early, this is uh, before the mass production of computers, so this is like before the IBM 605. This is, uh, these are two very like first generation computers, these are not even transistorized, and this is also when Fortran, for example, was in development three years before the UNIVAC. So very, very early period in terms of the history of computing. And what happened was that the SIAC and the its portable cousin, the DICIAC, were going to be in the same place for a couple months. And engineers and some bureaucrats at the National Bureau of Standards decided to try to connect them together and see what would happen. Now, uh, emphasizing, like, specific dates of events happening is, 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 is often very problematic, problematic, but nonetheless, April 12, 1954 is when they succeeded, when they got, it, got some uh, words going between uh, these two computers. And what's interesting about that experiment is that the way they talked about it and the way they visualized it was not that there were two computers being connected over some kind of separate link, it was rather that these two computers were in effect being merged, where the, when computers are connected together in this case to communicate, it's not that there's a separate network they're thinking about making, but rather it's an integration of the capabilities of these two computers. There's not this distinction between uh, network and the host. Now, as an aside, this experiment actually came with some fairly warranted promissory rhetoric, right? So in the report, uh, well, you can, in this report, when they talk about 
master-slave relationship. This is another reminder that the categories and metaphors and understandings of computing are deeply entwined with uh, politics, economics, and history. Uh, but when you see uh, this note that in the future we have widely dispersed groups of information processing machines that can be interconnected by means of a communication network, I argue that network means something a little differently here than it is for us. Uh, this is actually a fairly visionary statement, and the author is actually Mary Elizabeth Stevens. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, computing and gender and women in computing, this is actually an experiment that I hope people will pay some more attention to as uh, uh, some particularly uh, early and, in fact, I would say, uh, visionary work. Now, uh, here I'm just, um, it's part of my narrative, though, in terms of the separation of, of host and network. Now, the next kind of snapshot in time that I have to offer is, uh, this is actually Paul Barron's design for that communication network he was, he was talking about, uh, when he was making the details. And so this is what he called his distributed adaptive message block network. And in the design, you see these things, uh, S's, these are the switches, and this is something called a multiplexer, which is basically you'd have up to a thousand telephones connected to each switch, and the multiplexer would take all of those telephone lines and put them onto a single line. And in this network, notably, there's no computers connected here. Paul Barron's, net, Paul Barron's famous distributed network was something to connect phones together to do digital voice, right? To do Skype, to do voice, basically, we call it today. And furthermore, for uh, something significant for us with Paul Barron here, is that there wasn't going to be, like, for example, personal ownership of these telephones or something like that, whereas some other kind of institution or agency would run the network. The way Paul Barron envisioned this, it would all be controlled by a defense agency. Uh, at the time, it would have been the Defense Communications Agency that would have run this. So he foresaw a network that was really just a network without these other computers, like without a separate set of computers attached to it. And then, furthermore, all run by the same organization, so seen as a kind of single infrastructure. Uh, when he talked about how you might be able to attach computers to this in the future, he made nods to that. It was not interactive computing, but rather just a way to, uh, you know, dump a, a table of punch cards like onto the line. It would be easier than shipping it to just like send bulk information over that. It wouldn't have been like interactive online use the way that we understand hosts on networks today. This all starts to change, though, uh, in the mid-1960s. This is a uh, diagram for a, the three UCLA nodes of a network <coughs> project that was funded but failed, the California Computer Network. This was supposed to be the first wide-scale network uh, in the United States, large-scale network in the United States, and by extension of the world, uh, by DARPA. Didn't go anywhere, but when they were designing it, they were starting, to, and this is uh, Steve Crocker, who was a well-known computer scientist at this time, a student at UCLA. When he was designing this, they, they were starting to think through that the, the, this process of creating networks with different kinds of computers would be easier if you used like, uh, very like, uh, purpose-built machines that would just have the job of exchanging information between those computers. Right? So you can see, in the middle of this diagram, these are the three systems that they were connecting. And then there'd be machines that are just designed to transmit information between them. So this looks like the beginning of a separate network for a uh, for computer communication. Although in this case, it you know they hadn't actually got to the point of designing protocols, so there wasn't the kind of rigid separation that we that we find today. Uh, I'm almost done this part of the history, and then things will get a little less uh, names and dates. The emergence of kind of the modern network diagram, the category of the separate network and the separate host that would be uh, recognizable in like a computer science networking textbook, really shows up probably for the first time in 1966 in uh, the National Physical Laboratory, the team of a computer scientist, Donald Davies, in the United Kingdom. And this was a design for uh, a packet switch network, so a network that would send data in uh, Said data that's broken into pieces, and it would send it through a distributed network, much like Paul Barron's. And what's interesting about this is that Donald Davies and his team uh, understood that they'd be building kind of two things. There'd be a network that would just have this job of sending information between things, right? That could be understood and built in isolation, and then you would connect with interfaces, host computers, to that network. 
Now, because of some kind of short-sighted funding uh, situations going on in, the, in, in England at the time, this didn't really get built, uh, more than a single note of it. But that's okay because in the United States, DARPA was funding computer networking very generously. And the uh, DARPA, which used to be called ARPA, is a defense agency that's its job is to kind of make new technologies for the United States Department of Defense. They had been influenced by, in part by Barron, in part by Donald Davies, and they put out a request for quotations to build their own distributed <coughs> communications network. They would have looked a lot like the thing that Donald Davies, was, uh, Donald Davies and Paul Byrne were talking about. Uh, but what happened was very interesting. They put out a request for quotations. They sent it to a uh, low hundred number of defense contractors. And the winning proposal to build the network was a uh, East Coast contractor uh, called Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, or EBN. And in the, in the proposal, the winning proposal to build this network that would be called the ARPANET and would serve as the first internet backbone, you have this text from EBM that says, after considerable thought, we have reached the conclusion that the imps and their organ operation should be initially implemented with the maximum logical separation from hosts and host programmers that can possibly be attained. So they were saying not only, because DARPA's design was they had a separate network and they had hosts that would connect to that network, but the responsibilities between those two things were a little fuzzy at times. So when BBN wrote back, they said, you should cleanly separate not only the technologies here, have the nodes of the network do one thing and have the computers do their own thing, but it's hosts and host programmers that have to be separated as well. So the people, the, there has to be a rigid separation between the people, the organizations that are responsible for the network and that will be responsible for the hosts that are connected to it. Now this makes sense, right? When I go on the internet, I don't have to have a say in how the network that carries my data is run. This is sensical to us today, but this was a innovation. Uh, at the time. Uh, and it was a, an important uh, demarcation because what ended up happening was the, in the, as the ARPANET had networks connected to it and became the early internet in the late 1970s, you had control of the backbone move from DARPA to a, the Defense uh, Communications Agency, DISA, to the civilian world and then it was privatized in 1995, and the internet backbone went to uh, five uh, firms and uh, uh, consortiums. And the separate control of the network itself from the devices that would be connected to it uh, continued. And it was a path dependency that remains with us today. It makes sense in, uh, in a lot of ways to talk about the internet as being separate from the devices uh, to which it is connected. I'm not saying that there would have been a better way to do it, only that it was something that had to be created uh, and was a kind of historical product. And then today, there's, you, know, you can look up data on, for example, the top 12 internet uh, backbone uh, providers now. And what's interesting about this is it's from this distinction that we get net neutrality, right? It's because there's this notion of a network that's supposed to be independent of the messy society in which it's a part that will just neutrally transmit information for everyone connected to it, uh, you have, uh, as a consequence of that, uh, a political conflict between, on the one hand, firms that are responsible for the network, and in this case, on the other, firms who largely live in hosts, firms that offer services from you know, servers on the internet, and they want the network to stay uh, what's called neutral. And these are, this is an example of some of those firms. Now, in order to talk about a network emerging, a communication network that is a model for how society got reconstituted, as a fair number of works uh, that look at the emergence of our information age do, there needs to be a kind of isolated and disembodied network for that metaphor to make sense. And there are reasons today why that distinction that was constructed in the late 1960s is actually starting to break down. One of the reasons it's breaking down is that firms that are responsible for the internet backbone have increasing ownership in some of the more uh, popular like host destinations on the internet. Right? So in this graphic, for example, you can see that Comcast has shares in these firms, AT&T uh, and Verizon. Uh, and this is actually a topic that a colleague and I, Stevens, are starting to study quantitatively to get a sense of how, this is, how well this is progressing. 
the other thing that's going on, why this clean separation of network and host, pardon me, makes a little less sense now, this is from Wired Magazine, is that there was this kind of old model of uh, how the internet worked that is used in, in net neutrality debates where I, the red dot, would connect to my ISP Comcast that would send my traffic through the internet backbone to get to the host, in this case Google, that I would want to use. Uh, one argument is that the actual structure and function of the internet today is, is different than that. Right? It's actually, I connect to my ISP, which within it has a content distribution network, a kind of <coughs> local home of Google's data uh, that is replenished through a direct private connection between Google and Comcast. And the role of the internet backbone and all of that is actually fairly uh, incidental. So this, this kind of first part of this talk is then is that this separation between uh, the host and the network was constructed historically. And it, it, was, it created a sense that there is this kind of separate thing with its own logic uh, that is separated from kind of the messy politics of society that we can talk about. And now that today it actually seems to be uh, disintegrating uh, a fair bit of this. Uh, distinction. Second thing I'm going to talk about is this distinction between plain text and ciphertext, uh, which is, and looking at from 1945 uh, until 1976, uh, I noted that theories of kind of the network of information society require a formally separate network. They also require a uh, separation of uh, plain text from ciphertext, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, especially because this seems counterintuitive, right? Because encryption is seen as a liberatory tool, right? This is actually something that's promoted as a way to liberate yourself from corporate or state surveillance. Uh, but so it sounds a little, it's, it sounds a little counterintuitive, but uh, hear me out here. So you can go back to Claude Shannon. He is uh, one of the major figures of information theory. Uh, this is uh, a new way to understand information and to understand how information is communicated. Uh, this is seen as kind of an immediate step before the development of modern data communications. Uh, information theory gives you a way to calculate, for example, the channel capacity of, of, a, of a particular link. It also gives you powerful tools to uh, look at how information can possibly, the ways it can be encoded. And one of the things that Shannon said in this, is, this quotation is from a declassified 1949 version of a classified 1945 paper, something that he repeated uh, in oral history interviews uh, many years after the fact, is that this question of uh, how to secure information from tampering with cryptographic tools is deeply related to the problem of how to encode information at all and how to transmit information over a channel in the first place. So there, was, there wasn't this kind of natural split between encoding information just for you know, open transmission and the act of encrypting it. This was seen as a tightly related problem. Now, when we come back to Paul Barron in 19, uh, 1964 with the publication of his uh, paper series on how his distributed network would work, it wasn't actually going to be a unencrypted you know, civilian network. It was going to be very encrypted. There was going to be very little place for unencrypted information on this network at all. Uh, so much that he actually, this is a diagram of how he would double encrypt all the information on this network he wanted to build. Uh, not only would, when you, when you sent a packet from your device, or from, you know, if you picked up one of the phones and called somebody, would the packet be immediately encrypted for decryption before it was received on the other end, but at each hop, through each node along the way, it would be encrypted and, re uh, and decrypted and decrypted, encrypted and decrypted at each step, so that if I intercepted that packet halfway through, I wouldn't be able to see the ultimate origin and destination. So this would protect uh, the people using this network from analysis of traffic patterns and who was talking to who. Basically, it would prevent the kind of metadata surveillance that we're more uh, familiar with today. So Paul Barron, the, in his original design for a distributed network, there wasn't actually much in the way of uh, unencrypted uh, text at all. It was, what was in its place was this notion that if you're doing networking, you're working with encrypted information, and that's just part of the infrastructure and the architecture uh, of a network. And 
the way that this was then, the way that cryptography was applied to actual networks, though, in the history of computer networking, is a little different. Uh, while with people like Sh Claude Shannon and Paul Barron, the links between uh, commun data communications and cryptography were very tight, when it came time to actually build the first wide area computer network in the United States, uh, the ARPANET, and then extend the ARPANET by adding networks to it with common protocols to make the internet, it was actually a different approach they took. Because the ARPANET started as just a test bed, an unclassified experiment that was used by civilians. And it eventually became popular. Like networking took off through the early 1970s, more and more military installations came to rely on the ARPANET to do their work. The problem was that you had all these grad students on the ARPANET as well, unclassified grad students. And grad students, I was a grad student once, so I'm not saying anything ill about grad students, but they were not to be trusted in this military <laughs> environment. And that's a problem if you have all these grad students on your network and you want to do classified work, and it's totally unencrypted, well, you can't, right? So in order to make that happen, what they did is they, uh, DARPA developed the first end-to-end -end encryption device for computer networks. It was called the Private Line Interface. And it was just a box that you would put between your computer and, the, and your local packet switch. So that if I was going to uh, send a message to Roderick, my, uh, my crypto device would encrypt it. It would go through the, message, uh, go through the, the network, and it would be unencrypted uh, for him to read. Uh, and this is a map of the ARPANET in 1976. And this is the first time that one of those crypto, like end-to-end -end cryptographic devices shows up. And what's, uh, incidentally, a colleague and I, Morgan Curry, wrote uh, not one, but two papers just about these maps, because uh, we think they're very interesting. Uh, but on the, one of the things we noticed is that the first time that one of those cryptographic, cryptographic devices shows up, there's only one of them, right? But you need two to make a connection. So the fact that there's just one uh, means one of two things. Either there's a lot of other ones on here that haven't been reported, or this cryptographic device is actually used to uh, engage in an encrypted uh, link with one of the other uh, highly classified defense or intelligence community networks that the ARPANET was attached to during this early period of networking. So you'd be able to get to your smaller encrypted network through an encrypted channel in the ARPANET. That would, that's what it would be for. Now this is a uh, this is significant because as the ARPANET expanded and then became the kind of very early internet in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was more and more of this going on as the defense and, and intelligence community used this network more and more, something that's uh, covered in Yasha Levine's new book, uh, Surveillance Valley. And there was, this, uh, there was this interesting thing that happened where, you know, even though they had end-to-end -end encryption on these, on these military channels, uh, it wasn't enough. They were still unhappy with the fact that they were, the military was sharing this network with, you know, again, graduate students. And in 1983, what they did is they moved all of their base, like all of the defense agencies, departments, combatant commands, all these pieces of the military, the NSA, they moved, uh, the intelligence community, they moved them from the ARPANET onto their own military internet. So it was this separation between all of the civilian sites and all of the military sites. The military side was called the Defense Data Network. It went online in 1983. It's the predecessor to the existing uh, NIPRNET, CIPRNET, JWICS that we have uh, as defense networks in the United States today. What was left was a completely unencrypted and open uh, early civilian internet that was in place as an experimental internet so that people could test things before putting it to work for the people that mattered in the military. And this continued where there was this early civilian internet that had no encryption on it, that had very little security on it, not by accident, but by design. Because all of that, uh, all that, all that encryption was reserved for use by the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. And this kind of, this situation where this was this kind of created uh, and manufactured openness of the civilian internet continued through the 1980s, and it wasn't until the early 1990s when there was a lot of work uh, undertaken in order to put cryptography kind of back into the network and re-secure it uh, so that you could actually, for example, do commerce over it. And it was in 1996, after the crypto wars, 
conflict with government over cybersecurity standards, where uh, asymmetric key cryptography, the kind of basis of secure transactions in Vermont today, really took off and the internet became uh, more secure again. But what this meant was that there was this period from the early 1980s through to near the end of the 90s where you had a internet that was unencrypted, that was open, right? Which, again, wasn't just kind of a natural outcome, but it was something that was constructed. So not only did you have a network that was separate from the things that were attached to it, but you also had a network that was plain text uh, in the open uh, and unencrypted. Now, when we come back to some of the kind of major works that talk about the significance of networks in our society today, not only literal networks like the internet, but networked modes of organization of politics and the economy, you, have, you find some very strong statements about how this network architecture is as by its very design, open and free. So for example, Emmanuel Castells in 1996 writes that the architecture of the network is, and it's referring to the internet here in part, is and will remain technologically open, uh, enabling widespread public access and seriously limiting governmental or commercial restrictions to such access. So note here that there's this notion of this network that is naturally free. And things like governments and commerce, like the state and capital, like things that make up the way that we organize a lot of the rest of our society, are separate from that network, right? It's naturally free. It's been kind of formally separated from the society that, that gives, it, gives it its form. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. You, you said a couple minutes ago that um, the internet had been plain text and then it became secure again. Or, and, um, when you say that, do you mean that those technologies became available or that there was something somehow mandated in the protocols or required about that encryption? Uh, they basically redesigned uh, cryptographic technologies for the civilian sector. So there was there was end-to-end multi-level security going on in the military, uh, but when it, and there was actually a lot of interesting hooks, like in TCP IP, there's ways that you can attach a bunch of different cryptographic technologies to those protocols because the military uses them. You can see it in like an IP header. Mm -hmm. So, and some of that was made use of, but basically it was an effort by engineers to kind of start from scratch uh, because that was all classified. So not only was it on a separate network, but the people that worked on it weren't allowed to tell people how they did it really, right? So, I mean, you could, there's a bit of it that was unclassified, but it didn't really, it was basically an effort. Some of the cryptographic primitives were used, right? It's not like you had to invent new math but the implementations were going to be different. And it was just out of general understanding that security is good, and also that we will eventually want to do commerce on this on this lovely internet, so we need to put stuff back. Does that answer? Yeah, I think I'm, I was just kind of curious about kind of when you say that it becomes cryptographic, and that means that it becomes possible to encrypt cryptography, or that everything on, like all traffic, becomes encrypted somehow. Well, that's actually, so that's actually a, a difficult measurement question where the, the timeline that I have here basically indicates that you have R&D in the early 1990s to make things more secure. And then by 1996, you have at least what, like security of information being sent over the network being increasingly encrypted. And now you have like well over 50% of internet traffic, especially after Snowden, that really bumped things up. So now we're getting to a point what my uh, collaborator actually calls ubiquitous cryptography, which is where not only the content of the network stuff being sent over it, but the actual infrastructure itself relies on cryptographic techniques. So, so the, there's this, uh, on the one hand, there's a, from Castells, you have this notion that the network is and will remain technologically open. This principle that applies not just to the internet, but any mode of uh, social organization that uses those, uh, those techniques. Following up on that, uh, you have uh, Alexander Galloway in 2006, based on work a little earlier, referring to the work by Daniel Castells and saying that the networks that he describes are not, even, not mere metaphors, we're talking about real networks, uh, and that built directly into the technical specifications of network protocols are the fact that things like the internet cannot be central, centralized, it's impossible. And increasingly, Today, 
those kinds of claims about the inevitable freedom of the internet are, people are looking at not just uh, governments like the People's Republic of China, but throughout the world, it's clear that if the internet is not being radically centralized, it is at least very compatible with the liberal uh, social orders. This being the apotheosis of not only this notion that the internet will create freedom, but also that capitalism will also create democracy in this case. Um, now, I want to note that in, for Castells and Galloway and people that uh, work in this framework, the, the private sector is considered, and other forms of power are considered antithetical to this kind of dis the distributed property, of not only in the internet, but forms of social organization that use those principles. Uh, and in making that argument, they also re uh, rely on a form of uh, fundamentation of the information that goes over those that also does not grant incredible power to uh, particular organizations, as I'll uh, get to in a minute here. Now, there's a, a historian of computing, Nathan Ensmenger, who argues that the cloud is a factory, right? If we live in an in, in information economy, then the server farms, the, the cloud, is in fact this place where things, data, information is produced, where value is added, right? And if that's the case, and I think that's a fair, a fair metaphor, the cloud is a modern form of uh, factory in many senses, then the network is the circulation of those goods, right? The network is this kind of distribution system for the products of the factory. And I think that to think just about the network, right? Just about the network as the sphere of free and open circulation, disconnected from the uh, social conditions that gave rise to it and continually alter it, is problematic now just as it was problematic uh, in the 19th century. So, we can go back to, in this case, this is Karl Marx. And he's talking about how people will tend to look at free exchange under capitalism and separate that from the conditions of, for example, labor and life under capitalism. And he says if you just look at circulation, if you just look at the network distributions of goods under capitalism, uh, you see this uh, sphere of circulation that provides the kind of ideologues for capitalism with their views. But if you investigate the actual conditions that give rise to this, uh, this framework, you see a certain change that, it, that appears in the physiognomy of the cast of characters, of the uh, dramatis uh, personae uh, that, you, that you see. Marx goes on to write, I think this is a kind of a useful metaphor for today. He said if you kind of look at people that are just these free agents under free exchange in this distributed capitalist economy, he writes that you know these two people, well actually you can actually see that they have these unequal identities now. One is actually the capitalist, the other is the worker. One sparks self-importantly as an, and is intent on business. The other is timid and holds back, like someone who has brought his own hide to market and how now has nothing to expect but a ten. Ouch. So and this is Marx's way of saying you can just totally separate the economy from society and see it as this free place of exchange, but if you look at the social conditions that give rise to it, uh, that kind of shows you the fiction of that uh, ideology of the market. Now, to wrap up this talk, I want to keep this in mind and then actually go back to the work of Paul Barron and ask how he saw cryptography interacting with a distributed network. Right? His model, again, of the distributed network has seemed to be this blueprint for how to construct uh, fundamentally free, uncentralizable networks, either of, of, of you know, devices or of people. And I want to look back and see how Barron's, uh, Paul Barron saw cryptography in that, in, that, uh, in that kind of network. Because what I'll argue is that we are actually far more so than Castells and Galloway realized truly living in Paul Barron's world. We are truly living in the world of the kind of network that he, that he envisioned, but just in a very different way than that we, that we typically understand. So the first thing in this closing argument that I'll note is that we are applying cryptography to a bunch of different places uh, throughout the internet and the, even the content on the devices that are connected to the internet that weren't there before. So we have uh, ways of encrypting traffic over the internet, 
We apply cryptography to things like the domain name system to add security. We have ways to restrict the use of content that you can send over the internet back in the thing. And so we're recreating Paul Barron's world in that the network architecture like his is increasingly cryptographic. The information going over it is encryptically, increasingly cryptographic. And access to information on the hosts is increasingly restricted by uh, cryptographic means. Furthermore, just like Paul Barron's network design, single organizations are increasingly controlling uh, both pieces of the network and the, a lot of the major uh, hardware, a lot of the hosts, servers that are connected to it uh, through corporate centralization. So the question then is that what use does Paul Barron see in his you know, famous design of the distributed packet switch network for the role of cryptography? How does that function for him? Well, Paul Barron's design was, uh, it's really looked to as this thing that was supposed to be used just in a post-attack environment for nuclear war, right? But he also wanted it to be used as just like a normal day-to-day -day communication network for the military, and he thought that governments and other groups would be interested in this design. And in his list of things that would provide security, uh, security for the people using this network, the transmission of successive message blocks by ever-changing paths. So this is packet switching, right? This is what you can do with the distributed network. This was actually, for him, used side-by-side -side with cryptography, points number one and two, to further restrict access to the information on that network. Because now if you have information that's being, if I'm sending information <coughs> to one of you across this network and it's paths, the paths of all the packets of that information are different, it's harder to intercept that information. It's harder to make it be constructed. It's harder to get a picture of who's talking to who on that infrastructure, right? So what that meant is that for Baron in the in the day-to-day -day operation of this network, his combination of A, distributed nodes, with B, packet switching, and C, cryptography, would afford maximum power to whoever control both. Maximum ability to A, uh, prevent people from uh, getting access to information that they shouldn't, and B, being, at, being able to kind of tamper and modify. So in our current world, you wouldn't be able to pirate, for example, and you wouldn't be able to remix. And again, just to not, without putting too much of a point on this, cryptography was not simply a kind of uh, addition to this network, but it was a part of the way that it would provide uh, security against everyone outside of this classified community. Now, to make a kind of uh, comparison between a 1964 design for a military network and the internet of today, one of the immediate questions is, well, what would all this restriction be good for, right? We live in a society uh, that tries to produce as many goods as possible, as cheaply as possible. That's one of the kind of founding principles uh, of capitalism here. But I want to go back to another kind of old, uh, in this case, early 20th century economic thinker, Thorstein Veblen, who points out that overproduction means production and in excess of what the market will bear, basically. Right? So this is a, a, an early kind of understanding of capitalism that speaks to something that's actually pretty self-evident to, to a lot of us, is that too much production is a bad thing. right? If you produce as many goods as possible, as cheaply as possible, this might be good for society, but it's bad for profitability. Likewise, if you use this new information technology to make information as freely available as possible from you know, whatever movie studio or something like that, this is really bad for business. And Veblen under, uh, understood and argued that the other half of capitalism is not just producing as many things as you want, as, 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 as much as you can, but it's also the strategic restriction of access uh, to goods. So it's not only a restriction on the total amount of production, for example, that happens. But it's also a restriction on creativity itself. And when we go back to the question of the cast of characters, uh, like the dramatis personae of Paul Barron's network, it's useful to ask, like, who are we in that story, right? Paul Barron's network, this uh, distributed and encrypted network that uh, made it very, very difficult to access or tamper with or wrongly see 
uh, information, it was for actually a really small number of people. And if we, instead of entering the factory to reveal our true identities, we can kind of instead peer behind the architecture, it seems that we're less like lieutenants running this uh, military communication network than we are uh, revealed as, as the threat to the system, the thing that could potentially be being excluded uh, from access to things. Uh, thank you very much. To, uh, not to, con to distinguish between sort of distribution on a topological kind of mm -hmm. like network and distribution in terms of um, institutions, right? right. That, that, right yeah. So participating institutions. And as we were talking through that, and particularly <coughs> talking about the, uh, I mean, uh, arguably things are now topographically more distributed than they were, but institutionally less on the, mm -hmm. on, 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 on the internet. And I was reminded of. Um, Ben Peter's book, How Not to Network a Nation, and the right. sort of like the, 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 the Soviet experiences of um, or attempts to sort of to network things, which were very distributed in a technical sense, yeah. but of course entirely and completely centralized. And in fact, it's sort of the, the bureaucratic problems were essentially what sort of stymied the yeah, yeah, sort of or what's that, the whole yeah, the whole state information system. Unified all state. Yeah. Yeah, but um, oh yeah, it hasn't only emerged because it's true. So yeah. But um, but so I'm I'm wondering how to sort of read these two together. Is there like a necessary period? Well, not necessarily historically necessary, but you could argue that in fact that the it, the highly institutionalized, limited institutionalized um experience we have now can can only follow from a period of much more open institutional or much more more it's distribution right that allows the thing to emerge and then closes down yeah that's actually one so one of the things i point out is that if you had a very unified society right like the reason the technical reason why people start developing networks that would just do communicate information and then was so that they could accommodate different kinds of host computers right so because there were lots of different computer manufacturers in the united states because military departments have a lot of autonomy, because companies are all different, there were not like identical computers that could be attached. So that meant that you know, architecturally, like the easiest way out of that problem is to create a single language that they all use to communicate over the separate network. So it, it emerges out of actually a great deal of heterogeneity, but then it, yes, it does create the kind of opportunity for, uh, it, it doesn't do anything to actually prevent centralization from occurring over time. And that's one, so one of the things that I think is interesting is that you could look at the late 70s and the early 80s. Like, I don't fault Galloway and Castells for saying in this protocol is a decentralized or distributed kind of power architecture. But that doesn't mean that you can't uh, put it to work for increasingly centralized ends. Uh, but I, Peter, so I'm actually in the process, I, I have a colleague who uh, reads and speaks Russian. Uh, ben Peters has been extremely helpful providing some sources. And we're actually going to try to figure out what the architecture of those that early network was. So hopefully I'll have a very specific answer to your question in like three months. Like that. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that like, there's not really a central point of contact. Share with your foil. So yes. I just wonder if this does something different to this kind of 
I assume work with them day yeah. before news about. Oh, definitely. And so the, the first thing I want to I want to repeat that I really like myself. and I really like Galloway. Like you know, reading Protocol by Galloway, like you know, opened up a lot of avenues for me. And I don't see myself really as saying that they're fundamentally wrong about anything so much as kind of taking a different path. But I think so. I think what the difference is is that you know, Castells looks at concentration. I think he's right to do that. But what he also does, and Galloway, for example, can look at the centralizing tendencies of other protocols of like DNS. And he's obviously uh, not ignorant of the fact that we live in a highly kind of centralized political based world in many ways. But what I think there's a tendency to do in these and other works, and they do it in different ways, is that despite all the centralization, there's still this abstract notion of a network as having a distributed architecture that will then interact with the centralizing society. I'm saying that network that can never be centralized, that is fundamentally distributed, actually doesn't, there's no abstract, just like the, the market is, I mean, you can create a field of economics that can be kind of predicted, and you can talk about it as this abstract set of rules in this kind of disembodied space. I don't think that it makes sense to talk about uh, protocols as being any different than the given implementation and the given kind of state that they're in which is you know, just a kind of reflection of how they're being used in a given environment. So I guess what I'm saying is that this, just because architecturally we separated networks, uh, and just because for a while they were run by different organizations that seem kind of separate from the kind of regular rule of capitalism, it doesn't mean that we should, I guess, almost reify them in a, in a little, in a bit of a way. Because again, like, yeah, Castells is sophisticated about that stuff. And I think what I would like him to say is, and therefore, we don't need to talk about a fundamental inherent form of the network anymore because it doesn't hold a candle to these more prosaic forces. Does that answer? I think that's actually a big question. Mm -hmm. It's a very useful one for me. So does that answer? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah that's great. Thank you. Um, I have a question more out of my EP than anything else. But you know, when I think about encryption cryptography, I, th I think about backdoors. I think about the fact that metadata gives so much information away anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm a little bit unclear about what work cryptography is doing for you because you know it, it doesn't seem to me like it actually produces secret messages. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that what I'm interested in right now there's a, a lot of interest in cryptography as a thing that can be used to make tools that will ex that will uh, make it less necessary to engage in collective code action. Right. So instead of reforming whatever, I can download signal and then be free. Right? So that there is this kind of dominant kind of emancipatory you know, narrative that's attached to it right now. What I'm more interested in is that the original, like if we just use Barron as a, as a point to begin with, his view was that it actually centralized power to the Department of Defense very easily. And I think if we look at it on a macro societal scale, the kind of total sum use of cryptography today is more about DRM and more about protecting government secrets and corporate secrets than it is letting me browse whatever it is on the web without it being stored somewhere but never actually coming back to Hong Kong or something like that. So I think that, and this is something that, uh, this, this talk is more diagnostic. The, the book with Quinn DuPont will be more uh, analytical, but I think that what I'd like to do is stop talking about what I see as less significant uses of cryptography than the actual way that it, it enhances the power of the state and of business. Uh, maybe one more question. Yes. yes so uh, the public infrastructure, uh, they uh, rely heavily on their certification, certification authority. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they are citizens that trust something is, but not uh, when, I, when I read about, read about them, they say that uh, they don't trust it because of technical issues, but sometimes they say because of political issues, for example, that CA is that in that country or this country. Does that have I mean, so I think that one of the fascinating things about developing this effort to take a totally unencrypted internet and add security to it is that when you built the, when those security protocols were created, like sort of like RPGI, DNSSEC, you not only have to make security protocols that map onto the existing protocols of the internet, but you also have to make security protocols that map onto the institutional realities of the world. Right? So, for example, certificates require the existence and a way to verify trusted organizations that can issue them. Right? So it's an extremely challenging process, and I think like the way that that would immediately relate to this talk is that 
you get that kind of problem because it was something that was really added on uh, decades after the, uh, the network was actually designed. And on that point, there's this thing called the end-to-end -end principle, which is very dominant in computer science and networking, which states that uh, the, as, much function, as many functions as possible should be moved out of the network and should be done by computers attached to it, things like error correction and uh, a bunch of other things. Networks should really just be sending data kind of dumbly through the network. That's seen as a powerful engineering principle, but it's also a kind of rationalization of the fact that those people were locked out of all the decisions that matter for the design of the network, right? You adopt an end-to-end -end principle and say, we'll just put all the security on the edges because you have zero right to contradict what DARPA says or DISA says the network is actually going to be. So it's a post hoc kind of justificated, you know, uh, is this being recorded right now? Still? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's a really, <laughs> it's a great principle. But no, like architecturally, it actually makes a lot of sense. But it, it, it responds, it, it, is, it is contending with the fact that, we, that a lot of like, major decisions have been blocked out. And I've talked to some of the kind of uh, security engineers who've been around for a long time, and they said, yeah, one of the really challenging parts of our job is that they built a network and then called us in and said, hey, can you secure that thing for us? It's like, come on, guys, why didn't you talk to me 15 years ago, right? So the difficulty that you identify is from this act of adding it in after the fact, I think. And that's how that would relate to what I was talking about. All right, in which case I'd like to, again, thank Greg for a, for a, great, um, for a great talk and invite you all downstairs for some, I swear, unrecorded conversation um, <laughs> over, over food and drinks on the floor. So thank you. Thank you.